This is the Sports Business Classroom audio experience with Rick Paulson. Today's guest is Rick Paulson. Rick is one of the finest basketball players in the rich history of St. Mary's High School. He was the first basketball player inducted into the St. Mary's Athletic Hall of Fame. Rick has been a leader in his community and has donated his time to many charities, to many local boards, and coaching youth basketball and baseball. His coaching style is about teaching life lessons through sports. He has received many awards in his community because of his involvement, his leadership, and fundraising. Rick has been inducted into the UOP Athletic Hall of Fame, received the Pacific Distinguished Alumni and the Amos Alonzo Stagg Awards. Rick began his career with New York Life Insurance Company in 1983. Rick considers himself a businessman who sells life insurance. His emphasis is on working with families, professional athletes, affluent individuals, and business owners on business, estate, and charitable planning objectives. He is in the Cabinet Hall of Fame and has qualified for membership in New York Life's Chairman's Council, the highest level of production. Rick also finds time to be a national speaker, a guest lecturer, and last spring, his victory tour, Your Game Plan for Success, visited multiple cities across the U.S. All proceeds from the tour were donated back to charities in his community, and his goal is to have a great day every day. Rick is married to Nancy. They have two boys, Max and Grant, and today Rick is noted for creating values, a positive attitude, and his contagious unselfishness to his community. I was personally interested in talking with Rick because not only does he love basketball, but he has built a very successful insurance agency, has been a tremendous influence for his community because he cares so much about people. Welcome to the Sports Business Classroom audio experience. My name is Arthur McKibben and I am an alum of the Sports Business Classroom Immersive Program in 2022 where I took part in the scouting, video, and analytics major. For the next several weeks, I will be hosting an alumni takeover series where I highlight some of the people that I look up to in our profession. The path to success in sports, business, and life is not an easy one. There are many challenges and obstacles that must be conquered in order for you to achieve your goal. Personal growth and leadership development are two essential components that can help you to overcome these challenges and reach your desired destination. In this series, we will focus on the importance of personal growth and professional leadership development and how it can impact someone in their pursuit of a career in sports, business, and life. I'm super excited to be reunited with the SBC team again, and I can't wait to share with you all the amazing content that we have prepared. So without further ado, I give you Rick Paulson. Mr. Paulson, thank you so much for this opportunity to have you on the Sports Business Classroom audio experience. I'm truly honored and really excited to be the host for this episode with you because I can already see what value you will bring to our audience because of who you are as a person and your life and your business experiences that will speak to us, speak into us uh, today for our audience. To our listening audience, grab a pencil, a pen, or a crayon, whatever you can use to take notes because the gold is on its way. (laughs) (laughs) Rick, I would love to start out first with asking you about your early years of being an athlete. How were you introduced to sports? How did you fall in love with sports? And how did you know that you could excel in two separate sports? (laughs) Arthur, thank you. It's it's really an honor to be with everybody today. And um, I actually, you know, I'm six foot six. And so I was tall uh, right out the gate. And um, with that in mind, my my folks pushed me, not pushed me, but introduced me to sports. Uh, My dad, who was a big sports fanatic, would take me to games and we probably started going to sporting events when I was second, third grade. And I, I, I enjoyed the crowd, the whole experience. It was a basketball or the baseball or um, I, I didn't even care where we sat. I just thought I, I, just the whole experience of performing, um, the competitiveness, the crowd. I just I enjoyed everything about it. And I will say, you know, with my dad, I had a great relationship with actually Arthur. My dad was the best man when I got married. Oh, wonderful. So we always had this great relationship growing up. And, um, you know, he coached me, introduced me to sports. Um, but he also was smart enough to know when to back up and let me and put me in scenarios where 
um, I always seemed like I was, because I was taller, I was playing with kids older than me, yeah. players that were better than me. So I was always kind of out of my comfort zone. And then over a period of time, it would force me to, I had to get better, to compete with them. And I think that's why I really fell in love with sports was, again, the competitiveness, the crowd, everything, everything that has to do with sports. Nice. My, my daughter, I coached basketball many years. And uh, she tells me now that she loves the sound of the ba- of shoes on the basketball yeah. court. That's <laughs> like her favorite. We'll never forget uh, that. That's right. Yeah, a good point. That's one of her favorite sounds. So now, Rick, you played in a championship game while attending the University of the Pacific versus Utah State. You scored 10 points in that game. But tell us about those four free throws that you <laughs> made at the end of the game. What was that moment like? And have you ever used the memory of that to help you in business and in life years later? Well, you definitely did your homework. And um, that was quite a thrill. And uh, we, that was, we won our conference. And then we went on and played in the NCAAs. And actually, we lost to Marquette. Um, we had a bye, believe it or not. And then we played Marquette the year after they won the NCAA championship. So the whole thing was a great experience. But yes, you're, you are correct. Um, in the last minute, I had to hit four free throws. and um, they were one and ones, and which sealed the win for us. And I, I, back in my mind, I remember honestly that you know, I, not that I can't miss is that if I make these, we will win the championship. Ah. And so, a couple of housekeeping things. It's funny you asked me that, and I was thinking in preparation that I can't tell you how many times. I, again, I'm just celebrating my 40th year with the New York Life and right. as a financial professional, and I can't tell you how many times I've talked to groups of people that. When the referee would hand me the ball and I'm shooting a free throw, uh-huh. the only thing on my mind is imagining the ball going into the basket. Uh-huh. No negative thoughts. And that is exactly the feeling I had. I, mean, I remember it like it was hmm. uh, 10 minutes ago when the referee handed that ball to me when I knew I had to make these free throws. The only thing on my mind was I imagine the ball going in the basket. Yeah. So I was imagining success. There was no negativity. That's and, important. Uh, the other thing too is not take for granted. You know, I was a I was a really good shooter. I was I, I was a very good foul uh, foul. Sh- you know, I, I made my free throws. I was a good shooter, but obviously because I practiced. Yeah. Um, and I think in the business world, you know, like for example, if it's um, you need to have your reps, you got to practice. But I, the way I practiced was whenever I shot free throws, and if I hit the rim, it counted uh-huh. as a miss. Okay. So it challenged me a little bit. I always looked for ways that I could, you know, I might, I might make nine out of 10, but two of them, I hit the rim. So I only really made seven out of 10. So then when I was really under the pressure, it was easy because yeah. the basket was a little bit bigger and I had a better opportunity. So I'd always look for ways to make it a little bit harder, push myself out of that comfort zone. And so I've used that many times in my life as a springboard for, for my career. Uh, again, always believing in the positive and not thinking the negative. Yeah. Well, we might have to start another podcast for you. Uh, Nothing but net with Rick Paul. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> like that. Rick, you, you also speak about being under the leadership of coach Tom Stubbs. How would you describe his leadership, the impact that it had on you? And did you recognize it at the time in your life, the impact that it would have on you during your playing days and also in your adult life? Arthur, that's a great question. You know, I was, I was blessed. Um, I had two great coaches in college. I, I went to Pacific. I wanted, I wanted to play. Uh, I played basketball and baseball at the University of Pacific, but I wanted to go to a school, at, a D1 school that I could play both sports. And so I was on a basketball scholarship, captain of the team. And um, I had a great college basketball coach, Stan Morrison, who went from Pacific on after that. We won the championship game the next year, became the coach of USC and did well there. And so he really taught me the power of time management. I mean, literally owning every 15 minutes of the day. How he, and I learned a lot about practice and preparation, pre- preparation through him. And then Tom Stubbs, because I was captain of the basketball team, and I'd come out for the baseball. He just totally tried. He, he just treated me like a man. I mean, literally, mm-hmm. when we'd go on road trips, he would ask me to drive one of the team buses. I mean, really, you're not supposed to be doing that when you're a student on the, <laughs> a player on the team, but. Rick, you drive one, and then he would drive the other. And just he put that confidence and trust in me. And I personally, I love playing baseball at Pacific because they allowed me, you know, basketball would roll over late in the baseball. I missed right. about a few games, 20 games in this, of the season, or a third of the season. 
but I was outside. It was a different crowd, different group of people. It was a nice break because basketball is, is intense. And um, so anyway, I had, I had an amazing college experience. And I will say, Arthur, I mean, I spent so much time with athletes and the jocks and my teammates. Mm-hmm. I actually joined a fraternity. So I like just to break it up a little bit. So I jokingly say I played basketball and baseball and majored in fraternity. <laughs> I, mean, I had a great college experience, but I also had great mentors like Tom Stubbs, my baseball coach, who just treated me like a man and put confidence in me. And then I had a basketball coach that really taught me the power of organizational skills. Yeah. So going into a D1 school, wanting to play double sports, did they, um, did they encourage you to do that? Or did you have to sell them on the idea that? Well, I had to sell them on the idea that also I was a disciplined focused person that in the off season, I mean, I was always the first guy to practice last guy to leave. And um, my, I, my discipline never wavered. And I think they knew that. And um, I told them up front and then they said, well, let's do it your freshman year and just kind of see how it goes. Yeah. And I ended up starting on the varsity as a freshman on the basketball team. And then um, I just, they said my freshman year I could do it, but they also saw that uh, in the summer, I really put a lot of time in, you know, once baseball was over, I'd go back to basketball. Yeah. But unfortunately I was a pitcher, so I could always throw strikes and uh, every baseball team, they needs an extra arm. And so I used to get throw, I usually was a starter on Tuesday and middleman on the weekend. So, I mean, yeah. I, it was, it was perfect. I, it was a great your, experience. Your negotiating skills started early. <laughs> Very good. I, it sure did. Trust me. I, I, I learned through college outside the classroom too. I, oh, you're a hundred percent right. Very good. That's awesome. So, and for our, our SBC students, <clears throat> you know, that's an important, um, it's an important skill to not only have that negotiating ability, but also listen to the wisdom of others, but still follow through with your own intuition and your dreams and, and, and give it a try. Well, Arthur, I have to tell you, I hadn't thought about this, but also in my college experience, because I was on a full basketball scholarship, they would give me money for housing. Oh, so nice. I was living in a nice little, cute little eight unit apartment complex on campus. And we had this lady that was the owner manager of, was the owner and managed the apartment complex. So she'd come over, I'd say hello, how, how's it going? And one day I went up to her and I said, you know, you don't have a manager. I'm happy to be your manager. She said, you would? She said, yeah, if you do that, I won't charge you any rent. Oh, and nice. back there it was like $250 a month. My, it was $500 a month. I paid $250. My roommate paid $250. So anyway, I became the manager. I had an extra two hundred fifty dollars in my pocket, and <laughs> uh, so I always, from that point on, I always looked for opportunities within the rules to negotiate or create a better opportunity. But also, I, I was the manager of the apartment complex. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> I mean, there, back then, two hundred fifty dollars a month was a lot of money. That was a lot of money. Yeah, that's a lot of money today too. So, yeah. <laughs> but. Uh... Rick, we know you're very familiar with the NBA Summer League, and, and I want to you to share with us and to share our audience with, with our audience your involvement and experiences. But before you do that, can you specifically address our SBC students, both new and alumni? Because as you know, Sports Business Classroom Immersive Educational Training Experience provides one-of-a-kind learning opportunities for those interested in the business of sports and basketball and um, as we have been talking about your early athletic career and your college experience, how would you encourage our SBC community to embrace their own early beginnings and experiences that just might become a catalyst for themselves in their careers in sports? You know, Arthur, that's a great question. And, you know, it's no secret, first and foremost, that the sports business classroom is, there's nothing that compares to it. I mean, throughout this country or um, internationally, I don't think anybody, including yourself and the team and everybody behind the scenes, nobody brings their A game like this group does. Yeah. And so everybody should be somehow participating, attending, listening, because it's invaluable. And I also, I, you know, I can't take for granted of what Albert and Warren Legary have put together. I'm so proud of them and how they have really created not just something that's so valuable to the NBA, but tremendous enjoyment. To mm-hmm. so many people, so many families, so many people that can't afford to go to an NBA basketball game, but now can go to a summer league right. and really have that professional sports experience. And I mean, that, without their vision and their goal, their desire and their commitment to make it happen, we, we wouldn't be having this discussion right now. That's true. But I will say, though, that, you know, um, SBC is, 
you know, we, there's so many different directions you can go. But one thing that I have learned that I and just going back to my, I got involved in the professional sports world, uh, working with pro athletes because of, there's, there's one gentleman named, uh, he's a sports agent. His name's Bill Duffy. And he's had a great career. And uh, he's always got, he's always in the green room. We always, I mean, tremendous amount of clients. You can Google them. And, um, but we played against each other in college. We played against oh, each other okay. in the high school superstar camps that they used to have. They didn't have AA, AAU back then. We guarded each other. And then he, um, he went to Santa Clara. I went to Pacific. We had to guard each other. We were both captain of the team. And then he turned, then he decided to become a sports agent. I introduced him somewhere in my town, which opened up the opportunity. And his first two clients were Jason Kidd and Gary Payton. Oh, nice. Which coincidentally ended up being my first two professional athlete clients because he trusted me and I worked with them. And so I've had over a 30 year wonderful career working with the professional athlete space with many yeah. agents, many business managers. It's a profit center, it's part of the, our clientele. And so when I go to the Summer League, when I'm around the SBC, you know, I, it, you know, I always look for, encourage people to have mentors. I encourage people to, you know, take notes, yes. uh, be respectful. You know, go out of your way to ask someone a couple questions. Um, if you're volunteering, if you're participating, be the first one there, last one to leave. Outwork everybody. Right. You know, just I'm a big believer of I've never met anybody that was successful that didn't pay their dues. Yeah. And people, are, as we know, uh, we're at my, in my office, the people I work with, um, they like to surround themselves with people that are accountable, that, mm -hmm. you know, that um, – they don't create distractions. They have a positive attitude. They bring their A game. They look for ways to get better. And right. so anyway, that's, that's what I just think the SBC is. The speakers, the, the agenda, what you're bringing to people, you're really creating a springboard for them to have a tremendous success someplace in sports. Yeah, I I agree. I <clears throat> I'm an alumni from 2022. <laughs> last year great. I went and uh, um, just had a had a great time. I, I first started going to the summer league myself in in 2016. I think it was. I I took my uh, my oldest daughter, adult daughter. We went for three days and just had a blast. And uh, you know, just I went to to begin to develop relationships, but also have an opportunity to uh, to just spend some time with my daughter who sure. as an adult said, yeah, I'll go with you, dad. <laughs> so we got gone great. back a couple of times and then uh, COVID hit and we didn't get to go back. And then I went back. Um, uh, she had some other commitments. So I, but I've been going back uh, other than since COVID um, every year. And then last year really saw the opportunity and the value of, of sports business classroom for myself. Um, I was probably one of the older students at that time, but that's okay. <laughs> we, uh, we you never stop learning. learning. That's right. You never stop learning. And, and one of the highlights I, I was, I happened to be sitting with um, Warren Legary in the uh, Cox pavilion and uh, we were talking and, and he says, Hey, you want to go meet Jerry West? <laughs> Cause he had to go pick him up. And I said, uh, yeah. <laughs> so that was, it was just fun. It was a, it was a great time. And, and then getting to come back and, and be a part of um, the SBC alumni and this, this takeover series for Sports Business awesome. Classroom is, has just been a lot of fun for, for myself personally and, and uh, looking forward to doing some more. But um, uh, what advice would you give to our SBC community who are looking to gain exposure to elite athletes, sports teams, and front office personnel? Well, I'll tell you, um, I thought about this. And I've always told people, you know, you know how you spell it? You got to get lucky. Mm. But how do you spell luck? W-O-R-K. Right. Make your luck. Yeah. And so, like, one of the things I, I suggested over the, um, is, you know, like, I used to always, early in my career in the financial service world or anything I ever did, I'd always volunteer to do something that no one else wanted to do. Mm. And I would just kill it. And then I would just, yeah. and that's how I gained people's respect. And so I'll tell you a little story, too. And this applies to everybody listening. Many years ago, I read this great book. I've heard him speak a, few, a whole bunch of times, but his name's Harvey McKay. And he wrote a book called Swim with the Sharks. Oh, yeah. And in that book, he talks about many years ago, they did a study at Harvard. And they interviewed the top 100 students at Harvard at the School of Business. Mm. And they said, how many of you have a plan, have a goal, have a direction with your life? Only three did. Wow. 20 years later, they go back to the same 100 students. 
the three that had a plan, a goal, a direction with their life, and brought enthusiasm and confidence and just worked their tails off, created more wealth, more success, and more happiness than the other 97 combined. Wow. So my advice is, you know, when you go into any, any event, any challenge, any day that, you know, you bring your A game and mm-hmm. you, you outwork people. And, um, but, you know, look for ways to get out of your comfort zone. Do something no right. one else wants to do and uh, do a little bit more. I, mean, I always say it's easy to be good, but it's hard to be great. The difference right. is this much, but are you willing to do it on a consistent basis? Mm. And trust me, over a period of time, people notice. Yes. And you will separate yourself from everyone else. Yes, absolutely. My mentor, John Maxwell, says consistency creates, uh, cr- consistency compounds. He, yeah, he's the best. Yeah. What, what might you say could be some of the biggest challenges a person could face trying to, to have a career in sports or working for a sports organization? Well, I'll tell you, um, first and foremost, I would say time management. I mean, you have to be organized. If it's, you know, whatever you do, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes, but you're going into each day, you have, you have to be off and running. You've got to have be dialed in. And right. a couple of things that I have to start off every day, and, um, you know, what do you do to create momentum going into your day? So you're on your toes. I mean, we're human beings. We don't wake up every morning like, I love life and positive. Stuff happens. Right. But you've got to have certain, and I call it 10 before 10, where I do 10 productive things every morning before 10. One of the mm-hmm. things I do is I do a, what's called a warm-up call. You know, you stretch and warm-up before you exercise. Well, before, when I'm driving to work every day, I call right. someone to make their day. Oh, nice. Happy birthday. Congratulations. Just wanted to reach out and say hello. And if you get someone's voice, get someone's voicemail, Leave the best voicemail message they've ever heard. I mean, get an A-plus in voicemails. You want to be that type of message that the person saves because every time they listen to it, it makes them feel better. The other thing, too, is at this stage of, of, of your career, you need to surround yourself with people that are smarter than you. Mm. Create yeah. a Rolodex of relationships of, and then stay in touch with people. But you got to be disciplined. you got to be organized to do that. Arthur, one of the biggest cancers in business or development and growth of people today is the lack of organizational skills. You know, they're dialed in on Monday, Tuesday, and by Wednesday, they're slowing down. By Friday, they're back to their old habits again. But the ones that have the laser focus discipline to get after it on a daily basis, you'll blow by everybody. Yeah. So with that philosophy and that discipline in your life of that organization, um, how, how, how did when COVID hit, how did that impact you? Cause you, with having that discipline, you're, you're on track. And so when something that big and that significant changed the landscape of business and life, um, you know, when you had that in place for you, what, what, what were the results of that for you? Great question. And I will say we're all throwing curveballs. Yes. And when COVID happened, we had to embrace it. Okay, so we had to find new ways to navigate, first and foremost, for someone's happiness, for their health. Right. And I will say that in my office, every day we brought our A game, but we had to take it to another level. You know, we had to truly own the details. We had to hold ourselves to a higher standard. Right. Because people were like, they were looking, I mean, honestly, we Mm -hmm. we put up guardrails and just got after it. And and we we connected with all of our Rolodex relationships and resources and our clients. And we would look for ways, and this is how I live my life, my office does here too, is, Mm -hmm. Arthur, what can we do to make your life better? How can I help you? Right. And that's, we, and then when we communicate with people, we would lead with education, not try to sell them, or we would just look for ways, how can we make your life better? What's happening? Be a good listener. But we embraced it. We weren't feeling sorry for ourselves. We were on our toes because people look for people that, you know, tell me what to do. Be a leader. And no one wakes up as a leader. Right. You know, and you've talked about <laughs> Maxwell and everything else. But, you know, there's certain reasons why everyone has something that they do that gives them confidence, that gives right. them an edge. And I know we're going to talk about this, but my edge is preparation. Okay. I know yeah. going into every day, I am overly prepared for like today, this, uh, this right now, our podcast, my meeting with clients. And so a lot of times they say, Rick, well, you know, gosh, I'm so busy and how do you find time to really be overprepared and right. do everything you want to do? And so I say, hey, it's really simple. Wouldn't it be great if four days a week you can 
you had an extra, or let's say, yeah, wouldn't it be great if you had an extra eight hours a week? <laughs> yeah. Four days a week, get up two hours earlier. Just make yeah. it happen. <clears throat> make it happen. Plan your work, work your plan. But that's what, that's what successful people do. They pay, I've never met anyone really successful that didn't pay their dues. Right. So during COVID, during a challenging time, you get laid off, the business is relocating, whatever the case would be, embrace it. Yeah. And stand your toes. Stick to your laser focus process that gives you that edge, that preparation, whatever it is. And trust me, you'll have great success. You'll blow by everybody. You won't even blink. You'll stay on your toes. You'll have nothing but great success. Yeah. You know, when COVID hit, um, I was scheduled <clears throat> to go to uh, uh, Orlando, Florida in March of 2020 with the Maxwell Leadership Team for our annual conference. And two weeks prior to that, event um they they made the decision to cancel it because uh, of putting people first <laughs> and realizing that they were going to have people from all over the country flying in and then may not get out wow and uh and so when in in that and putting people first is a is a strong theme for your company and yourself and even, I mean, and it cost millions and millions of dollars to make that decision. And yet it was the right decision because it was putting people first. And, and, uh, and that's, that's really what you're talking about. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And, but you have to be disciplined to do that. Yes. Yes. You know, you have um, to be, you have to be disciplined to do that. Yeah. Uh, one of my questions was also what's the more most important thing to consider when developing a career in sports. And I think you just answered it, that development and that preparation. And, uh, um, that's, but I will that's, say on top of that too, is building relationships. Yes. And how do you build relationships is, you know, you're accountable, you're consistent, you follow through, you remember the little stuff like, you know, happy birthday, congratulations, whatever the case would be, but you're always there. I can't tell you how much business that comes back to us because we never burnt a bridge. Right. I mean, never burn a bridge. Always take the high road. Mm, very nice. Uh, Wells Fargo had a commercial years ago, and, and the tagline on it was just, uh, never underestimate the power of a conversation. 100%, yeah. And, uh, I mean, I, and I, the Zooms are great, but man, when I get in front of somebody, I mean, I, I look for every way to make that person's day and empower them and give them confidence and and um, so you, it's easier to do that when I'm face to face. Yeah. Awesome. Rick, what, what was the motivation for you to transition from an athlete to an entrepreneur and an influencer in your community? Thank you. I, well, I tell you, like a lot of people I grew up, I wanted, um, I had a great college career, but I knew that I wasn't going to play at the next level. Mm -hmm. So I was really, really um, Interested in going into one of my really good friends. His dad was the general manager at the time, Scotty Sterling of the Golden State Warriors. And so I was thinking about maybe doing something at, as an athletic director or something professional sports. And and then the financial service side came along. And I always wanted to do something where, you know, I was the first guy to practice, last guy to leave. I'd outwork everybody. Well, I'll do the same thing in the business world. Yeah. In the financial service world. And then, but I also realize that I could still be part of the NBA or the professional sports or baseball or golf space through my relationships of sports agents, sports managers. And right now I'll tell you, we've never had more business coming our way of referrals of working with professional athletes, mm -hmm. their business managers, their families, um, ownership, et cetera, uh, general managers, agents, all the, everybody. Uh, because I think we've maintained a consistency of a great reputation uh, doing things the right way. So I am in the pro sports world, but as a businessman, not necessarily making decisions. And, and I also love the fact that every morning, Arthur, that I look in the mirror, I have my own board of directors meeting right there. <laughs> I am the president CEO of my own company. Yeah. I don't worry about someone coming in telling me we're not going to renew my contract. <laughs> yeah. Or you just got traded uh, somewhere yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's great. Rick, your uh, entrepreneurial career is very impressive. And Thank my you. mentor, John Maxwell, says leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. And so my question is, how have you been able to embrace your influence as a gift to help others? Well, I'll tell you, um, 
I don't say things that sound good. I say things that I do. Hmm. And um, I know one of the, you know, you, one of the questions that you were going to, we talked about was how do I leverage my edge? And my edge is preparation. Okay. And that gives me confidence. And I know that if going into each day, like before I leave today, I know exactly everything I'm doing tomorrow, pretty much the next 10 days. But tomorrow I know I'm going to own every 30 minutes of the day. I know every appointment, every phone call, everything that I'm doing, and I'm going to be overly prepared and my staff and team. And so we're going to embrace it. We're going to kill it. And we're going to separate ourselves from everyone else. And, um, but that, that's my edge is, is preparation. And I think you, if you don't have an edge, you better get one. And uh, it, could, it could be preparation. It could be hard work. It could be you speak two or three languages. You've got a Harvard MBA, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Make sure it's something that you think that's valuable that you can use on a daily basis. Yeah. So with our SBC students in mind, and we talk about the leveraging the edge, how, how do you find that? How do you discover what that edge might be in your life? Well, I'll tell you, it's kind of your necessity. Like, for example, when I started um, as a financial service with the New York Life Insurance Company, um, I was on straight commission. Okay. So out of fear, I, I couldn't fail. Uh, so I really had to be dialed in and cause I, you know, and, you know, making money is right up there with oxygen. You know, you got bills, you got to pay. Yeah. And so I, it forced me. And so I put myself out of my comfort zone and whenever I got comfortable, I'd get uncomfortable. I'd get a nicer car, a bigger house. I would do something. So it always, I always had that little carrot where I had to keep going. And then after a while, everything kind of took care of itself because you have processes and you create profit centers and you have cash flow and, Things kind of everything just kind of falls in place. Nice. Talk to us about the pillars of practice. Thank you. I know. Well, that's funny. I go around the country. I was in one of the top sports agencies the other day in New York City, and they had my 10 Steps to Success by Rick Paulson. And they were giving <laughs> me a bad time. But I'm just gonna go, you know, just take a, a minute here and I will go through those. And yeah, I, please do. I put take a take lot care. of time over the years. Give, give us I've the given a thousand presentations on this. But the 10 steps to the pillars of success. Number one is plan your work, work your plan. Nice. But do it on a consistent daily basis. Be consistent. You know, January 1, we're all bad zero. But why nice. is it some people have more success than others? Because they have great work habits that they do on a daily basis. Number three, you got to have a contagious, positive attitude. Mm. People like to be around people that are positive. No one likes to ride in the car or do business or talk to people that all they do is complain. You got to have a burning desire to want to be successful. You know, I always tell people the things you can control, yeah. be the best at. The things you can control, be the best at. Number five, you must get out of your comfort zone. You have got to look for ways to get out of your comfort zone. But because you have this process, you have that edge, you have this confidence, you have a springboard that allows you to feel like when the referee hands me the ball, like, I'm, the, I'm going to make this. Yeah. You carry that success in when you get out of your comfort zone, then you grow. And then you'll have more success, you'll have more responsibility, and pretty soon, whatever the challenge is, you're able to embrace it. Number six, be a professional. Just be accountable. Be on time. Dress for success. Your walk, your talk, everything you do, back it up. And also the power of just saying thank you or a thank you note. Yeah. Um, number seven, I firmly believe you need to be a good, you actually should be a very good public speaker. Okay. Communication, yes. What's your elevator talk? When someone asks you, what do you do for a living? You can't stutter. You got to be on your toes, dialed in, ready to go. Right. And um, if it's financial services, if it's a sports agent, if you're working for the Denver Nuggets, you have to be dialed in. And if they say, well, hey, we need to, we have an event coming up, volunteer to be the master of ceremonies. Be on the microphone. Gain people's respect. Learn all the little things mm-hmm. like, oh, by the way, I want to thank the following people. Please hold your applause till the end. So, we, you know, little stuff like that that people are going to say, who is she? Who is that guy? Mm-hmm. Boy, they are smart. They are dialed in. Now, if you're not comfortable public speaking, go take a public speaking class. Yes. You'll make more money. You'll have more success. And here's something else, too. If, as you have children. As you have grandkids, remember, as a parent, we are a book that our mm-hmm. kids are reading every day. Yeah, absolutely. If they see, hey, my, my dad, my mom's up here speaking. Hey, if she can do it, I can do it. Um, number eight, 
be a sponge to success. Mm. John Maxwell, just yeah. you know, listen, study, read, carve off. I'm going to read 10 pages every day of a positive motivational book. You know, little stuff that you do on a day, you know, just be a sponge. Watch that. I, you know, this show right here is phenomenal yes. for it. But be a sponge to success. Number nine, have fun. Find ways to have a sense of humor. That so You don't have to be a jokester, but enjoy life. Celebrate. Right. Yeah, just celebrate your success. Celebrate your friendship. Celebrate, you know, like, for example, we just, I was watching Mike Brown was interviewed recently. I mean, the Sacramento Kings had, obviously, a really tough, disappointing loss. But man, sure. they, had a great se- they had a great season. Yeah. You After you get through that 24 hours of that, that tough loss, and you take a step back, you start realizing, like, boy, this was a great year. Think about the crowd, what the culture they created, and all the wonderful things that happened. Celebrate your success. Have fun in life. And then number 10, really simple. Just be a good person. Mm. Treat people like you want to be treated. Yeah. And so anyway, those are the 10 steps there that from New York City to California somehow has found a lot of people, touched a lot of people's lives. And again, there's nothing magical, but are you willing to do it on a daily basis? Nice. Well, I, I promised the audience we would, you would bring the gold and you finished that number 10 with the golden <laughs> rule. So thank you. Uh, you you've uh, come through for me. I appreciate that. You know, when you talked about the uh, comfort zone, uh, Malcolm Gladwell did an interview. He, he wrote an article about Wilt Chamberlain. I think it was entitled the big man can't shoot. And uh, they did a, um, his free throwing was, to- was horrible. <laughs> and uh, but they changed him to shoot granny style, kind of like Rick, uh, Rick Barry. Rick Barry. And his percentage went up like in the 80 percentile. And um, he, refer- he reverted back to the old way of shooting because his self-image, he was afraid that people would make fun of him. And so he, he surrendered a better percentage <clears throat> for that comfort zone that he knew. And, uh, that, uh, that was, that came to mind when, when you mentioned yeah. that, because, a point. you know, being able to just to get out of that comfort zone, uh, you know, um, Sergio Milas always says that the, the, uh, the magic happens outside of the comfort zone. So we need to, to really pay attention to that. Um, talk to us, Rick, about victory every day. Well, I will we'll say that's something that, um, I'll, I've made millions of dollars with the victory every day. And that basically is, if it's your Franklin planner, if it's your to-do list, but I know going in every day, I know exactly what I'm doing. Like before I leave China, every, every appointment, every phone call, every email, every text, every single thing I'm doing tomorrow. And um, it starts off with doing 10 productive things before 10 o'clock. Yeah. And those 10 are geared around my health, my family, my business, my wealth, and my community nice. and you're making my community better say on top of my, my wealth, you know, my investments, my business, my day to day, obviously my family and my health. And so with that in mind, I, I always, I'm always doing 10 productive things before 10 o'clock. One of them is doing a warm up call, making someone's day. Um, the last Saturday I did two at one time. I wanted to get a workout in. I wanted to get my cars washed. So I called a cardio car wash. I put my two cars out in the driveway. I washed those two cars as fast as I possibly could in 20 minutes. I had two good looking cars and I was exhausted. Yeah. I mean, I just have fun with it. I get creative, but like I, I start every morning a little after five. And so, you know, like for example, between five and eight o'clock, I get a lot done every day. Yeah. And, and then I go from eight to 10. Okay. And then I go from 10 to 12, then from 12 to two to two to five. And then tonight. So I'm constantly crossing off, doing the stuff I need to do. I'm constantly having victories. Now, let's say I made the phone calls. I saw the people. I did my 10 before 10. I did everything on my list. I planned my appointments for tomorrow, the rest of the week. I did all those thank you notes. I got rid of those emails. I listened. I did that. I, did, I got everything done. But let's just say I'm in sales, and I didn't make a sale today. Right. Man, I've still had a great day. Right. Because I know if I do that tomorrow and the next day, I'm going to have nothing but great success. So I'm laser Focus. I put up guardrail, and whatever I have on my to do, my victory every day, my list is what I do. And uh, again, on my comfort zone, asking for referrals, seeing people. Uh, right now, we're we're doing some preparation stuff of relationship I have with Albert and Warren for the upcoming NBA summer league, 
I mean, working with Sammy and all the wonderful people. And yeah. so I, by doing that, I, I know, I know I'm going to have a great day. Yeah. And it's not like, and I, the word you don't want to do the <laughs> people that just do enough to get by is they come in Arthur and say, okay, what am I going to do today? Who I got to see? Who we got to call? They're already on their heels instead of waking up and having a game plan. I mean, and I learned that through, honestly through my college basketball coach of planning our work, working our plan. This is our practice schedule. This is our game schedule. This is right. when you do, you know, the, remember Bill Walsh, the football coach, 40, 49ers. He, he would um, script out, I think, the first 20 plays of every game. Mm-hmm. So anyway, script out your success, what you expect to do. And if you do that on a daily basis, you're going to have great success. And that's what the victory every day is all about. Yeah. And that's a powerful mindset. To not get distracted by the things you didn't accomplish or the results you didn't achieve or come your way for that particular day or moment, but stay in the victory mode of, but this is what I did do. Very good. Right. And, and did you learn that or did that, I mean, obviously you did, but did that come naturally to you or was that like a, a switch that somebody helped? <laughs> well, I will tell you, you when I was 23, 24 years old. I um I hired my I had I hired a secretary, and I was paying her twelve hundred dollars a month. And I said to myself, I don't even know how I'm going to make twelve hundred dollars a month. <laughs> and because I was just starting on the sales world, but I didn't want to do paper. I want I need to get someone in there, so I hired one of my best friends' wife. She was the manager of the local Macy's at the time. This is nineteen eighty three, many years ago. And so it forced me to before I didn't want to be what she's. I'm paying her to be here. I didn't want to be giving her things to do. I wanted to give her things to do when she came in. So I had it all laid out, all mapped out. And that's when I learned of planning ahead. So before I leave today, I made sure tomorrow I had all the stuff that she was going to do. The other stuff would fall in place. And then it forced me to start for, keeping my day organized. And so basically, I got myself out of my comfort zone. And it forced me to, back then, just write out everything that I had to do, that she was going to do. And then now I've got a full staff. Yeah, but still follow through with the same idea that when they come in tomorrow or any day, I've already got things kind of laid out or recommended or suggested for them to do, which forces me. To, so we're all organized. We're all dialed in. But that's what basically I had to do that. Yeah. To get up the ladder um, to pay my bills and get orga- just to get better organized because I just didn't want to do enough to get by. Right. That's that's awesome. Two final questions for you. Who is your favorite athlete of all time? And who is your most influential thought leader for you personally? Well, obviously, my dad was such a great role model. Um, but on the sports side, you know, there were so many. I mean, obviously, I, um, Pete Maravich and Earl Monroe, Jerry West. Uh, but I always kind of we all really focus as I got older on who was the most mentally tough. Mm. And everybody would say Michael Jordan. But I, what I appreciate about Michael Jordan was not what he did on the court, but what he did in practice. Right. And they say he was the greatest practice player of all time. He brought his A game every day, which made everyone else better. And I always remember that. And I can honestly say that every practice, every drill, everything we did, I gave it 110%. Every loose ball drill, whatever it was. And that just kind of, then I, I developed those habits. And it just becomes contagious. And you make your teammates and everyone else better. And then, you know, Rick Barry, and then the, yeah, baseball, there were, there were baseball pitchers. But it was always, as I got a little bit older, it was always the ones that were just had the mental toughness. Larry Bird, the, the discipline of God, all the pr- Magic Johnson, you know, the pressures on. I, I, what Steph Curry did the other day was oh, just amazing. He amazing. gives the team a pep talk about, you know, playing better, being more engaged, bring your A game, and he goes out and does it. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's, that's the stuff that I really I love and pay attention to is when someone says something and they walk to talk. Or everyone's expecting, I mean, like, I love in a Super Bowl where the two, the core, the two star quarterbacks are interviewed for two straight weeks. And they embrace it. And right. they, they have fun with it. And they go out and both have a great game. And there's no sign of nerves. And that's, just, I, that's what really motivates me. And I just, I'm always really, even in like, so when someone's singing the national anthem in front of 50 million people or something, right? I mean, they have to embrace that and just <clears throat> referee hands me the ball. The only thing I see is me having success and making the free throw. Yeah. People, you have to expect that you're going to have success. You're going, you things are going to go your way. And I love to study different people, not just in sports, but all walks of life that bring that to every day. 
Absolutely. Uh, John Maxwell has a book, Everyone Communicates, Few Connect. And uh, an illustration I use for that is I ask people, how many times have you heard the national anthem? <laughs> Hundreds, if not thousands of times. My question then is, but how many times do you remember who sang it? <laughs> you know, remember Whitney Houston, Super Bowl Sunday, it was yeah. just phenomenal. Uh, Roseanne Barr, but for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and that's that that moment of being able to connect with people on your message, you know, that that really makes them remember you. And, uh, you know, as we, as we wrap up for today, Rick, what final thoughts might you have to offer our SBC students um, if we haven't mentioned it yet? And you have two <clears throat> sons. If both of your sons or either one of your sons was planning on uh, a career in sports, I, I'm not sure what they're doing. I know they one graduated from USC. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, if, he, if they were going to be going to summer league this year, uh, SBC as an SBC student, what would your advice to them be as well as to the rest of our students to really thank take you. advantage of it? Absolutely. And, you know, as I, we wrap this up, thank you again. It's been an honor to be with you, Arthur. And I think I learned, um, I, I'm the presenter, but I learned a lot from you today also. Well, thank but, you, sir. Um, a couple of housekeeping things. I tell my sons, I also guest lecture at the University of Pacific in the School of Business. Every, every person mm -hmm. that is listening, watching, should be reading the Wall Street Journal every day. Okay. Now, the Wall Street Journal is not just about stocks and bonds and banks. and It's about the people that make money, mm -hmm. the people that are business owners, the decision makers. You know, what hotels do they stay in? What restaurants? Where are vacations? Where do they go? What are their, what's their thought process? What motivates them? What, you know, if you want to get up the ladder, you need to know what's going on in the world with people that write the check to make the decisions. So I would encourage you to spend, you know, 10, 15 minutes online or however you want to do it to read the Wall Street Journal. Number two is I always, it's interesting to me, and you've, I'm sure you've seen this, and I'm looking at right here, the hardcover business of the top books that are out there today. And why is it that every week, Atomic Habits yes, by James Clare Avery is always number one because it's about laser-focused habits that you do on a daily basis. Yes. And the, the other thing, I, uh, you know, like I said, you, know, you got to hold yourself to a higher standard. When you come out to the summer league, the relationships that you have, the school, the, or, you know, our, this amazing uh, business school that we have here for the student mm -hmm. you know, for all the, you know, for the student and the athletes and for everyone who's attending, Hold yourself to a higher standard. Build that Rolodex of relationships. Um, be respectful. Uh, you know, look for ways to get out of your comfort zone. But you know, celebrate life. Celebrate these new friendships. Celebrate of how lucky we are to have the NBA Summer League. Yeah. And thank Albert and Warren and the entire team for allowing us to be part of it. Yeah, that's amazing. The first year I went, um, I had taken my big camera. And, uh, and I'm taking pictures of people and I'm watching these two guys walk the floor and do things and pick <laughs> up trash. And, and I'm like, who are those guys? And I, I actually took pictures of their lanyards. I zoomed in, took pictures of their lanyards to find out who they were and read about them, read up on them and, and was just so impressed, um, by them, by their display of, of teamwork and just, I mean, influential men that were out doing picking up the trash along the side of the court and throwing it away, not telling somebody else to do it, but doing it themselves and being a part of it. And um, it's just electric to be a part of, um, of that, of the NBA summer league and, and the team that, uh, that comes together for that. And um, got to meet Sammy a couple years ago and, and it was just a lot of fun. And um so we uh, we're really appreciative. We are so grateful for you, Rick, for your time today, sure. and uh, much, thank you. Uh, much success and blessings upon you, my friend. And uh, uh, I'll be looking forward to seeing you in the uh, in Me July. Too. <laughs> thank you, and thank you, Arthur. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. God bless. You. Okay, have a great day. Thank you. Well, there you have it. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Sports Business Classroom Audio Experience with Rick Paulson. Highly successful businessman, community hero, 
accomplished former athlete, and just a really great human being to know. My three takeaways from today's interview with Rick Paulson. Number one, leverage the edge. The most successful people use their edge to better not just themselves, but the lives of those around them. Number two was pillars of our practice. Victory every way. Be a resource for others. Focused on education and have passion for other people. And then finally, number three was victory every day. We know that when our clients are victorious, their families, communities, and even we are too. Well, that'll do it for this week. I'm excited to learn and to grow with you all through this audio experience over the next several weeks. So until next time, bye for now.